Hi, everyone. It's uh, about two or three after one, so maybe we'll get rolling. My name is Cody Dodd from the ICPS, and we're here with Fred Wall. And maybe as a bit of an introduction, I'll say Guy Gordon here from the ICPS came back from a meeting with Fred, very, very excited. He said, uh, firstly, there are wonderful things that are going on uh, at the FCC in terms of customer feedback modeling. Um, he said, secondly, his presentation was very, very interesting and entertaining. Uh, and so Guy said, folks are really going to enjoy this. So with that said, uh, we're pleased to have Fred here. Uh, and uh, the webinar is covering 10 questions that help shape the FCC's customer feedback model. And with that, maybe I'll, uh, I'll take it over to, to Fred. Why am I here today? Primarily, I'd like to share our path to our current customer feedback management system and see if there's some lessons for others that might be able to learn from both our successes and failures along the way. So I will say this, though, just at the top, your expectations today. Um, research presentations are probably the least eagerly anticipated of all. I've seen I've given thousands, I think, by now, uh, and I've never had a first-time audience look forward to seeing me. In fact, this is typically the, the expectation I see in most cases. And, you know, that's, that's fair enough. So we do try and actually see to do our research presentations a little bit differently. So let me talk about the rules today for this presentation. First and foremost, uh, I usually like the audience to jump right in whenever there's a question. Now, it's a little bit different in this format, so just whenever you have a question, send it to Cody or Robert, and uh, we'll, we'll make sure we take it either during or we'll get to them afterwards. And that's the first rule. And the second rule, which is which is violent for me, uh, and that applies whether I'm talking with our board of directors, cardio senior leadership last week, or what have you, and that's what I always have co-presents regardless. And these are my, these are my three kids. Uh, Jonathan, Maggie, and James, respectively. They will show up gratuitously during the presentation here from time to time to help me make points or really just make the presentation a little better. So let me tell you a little bit about FCC before we dive into the feedback questions. So FCC, we're at about uh, 21, 22 billion in portfolio right now. We lend to the entire agri-food value chain from, from the equipment that gets uh, seed in the ground to wineries, Canadian wineries, we've had about, I think it's 14 consecutive years of portfolio growth, um, and we're largely a self-sustaining crown corporation. We're based in Regina, Saskatchewan, where I run the research team, and I'm pleased to say, uh, in my opinion, I get to work with some of the best people in the business. Uh, I just have a fantastic team that works with me in Regina. So, a lot of people have asked about our customer feedback management system, and essentially what we call our scoreboards process. So that's what I'm going to walk you through a little bit today. Ten questions to ask yourself when you're looking at a new feedback. So I break, I'll break this down into three sections. So concept, design, and execution. In my experience, uh, those of a research bent, but could be a program evaluation bent as well, tend to spend as much as 80% of the time on design. And I think that's that's proportionately a bit off. Design is, of course, very important, um, but I find the least time is spent on concept, and that's where I think you actually know, get the biggest thing for your buck. So that's where I'm actually going to spend the most time today as well. So with all of the questions I throw out to you today, in all, virtually all cases, these are things on which reasonable people will disagree. I'm going to share with you the path we took at SEC and why those things have worked for us. Uh, but by no means is it uh, some kind of iron law. So let's get started here. Uh, I've included this photo because I liked it. I will say that a couple of staff when I used this at SEC pointed out that uh, James and Maggie are holding sky vodka glasses in this photo. I, I would just like to assure everyone that uh, no vodka was consumed in the, in the course of this photo. So I believe those were root beer floats instead. All right, so let's talk in the first section here. Let's talk concept. So question one, I think it's the first question, before you gather information from clients uh, or employees for that matter, the first question you have to ask yourself is which strategic problem are we trying to solve? And I think I'm a simple guy and I like to break them out and break this sort of thing out into a few simple formats. So and I think largely it goes this way. So is it how are we doing and why? Or is it what's next and why? 
Occasionally, the same instrument will will suffice for both, but ultimately, you should know which of these is the priority. So, at SEC, we break our research programs down into essentially three hubs. We have what we call the voice, which is our employee research. Uh, we run an omnibus uh, with employees ten times a year that uh, different business units in the company uh, bid for and own slots to. Our scoreboards and analytics group and our vision group. And the scoreboards and analytics group, which is what I'll talk to you today, that essentially is what answers the question, how are we doing and why? Fundamentally, how are we performing based on our mandate? How do our customers see us? And our vision panel, which has garnered some nice publicity for us over time, what should we do next and why? They're fundamentally different vehicles for us, though. So our scoreboard system has three different processes built into it. The post loan survey, the report card survey, and the customer exit survey. I will I will discuss each of these in turn a little bit later. Uh, for the moment, that's just the big picture. So how are we doing and why we answer with these three processes? Question two we have to ask ourselves. What's the guiding principle for customer feedback or client feedback, program feedback, as the case may be? Um, that may sound like a bit of a plot attitude, so let me let me get into it. This is what it is for SEC, and this is something that many years ago now, we went to our board of directors to have approved. And it's essentially this. Every customer can evaluate us every year. So it's a simple guiding principle that drives what we do when it comes to evaluation. This isn't to say that every client will evaluate us necessarily, but every client has the opportunity to evaluate our service every single year. Why is that important? Well, first of all, it fits our market and how we differentiate within that market. So based on several pieces now, third-party research we've done, FCC leads, leads the table, essentially, in reputation amongst primary producers. Um, and the big part of that is our strategy of customer intimacy and customer experience driving what we do. It's what helps us weather the ups and downs. It, it's what lets clients know that we're in it for the long run. So experience is fundamentally how we differentiate So at FCC. And so our measurement system needed to align to that. So that's why we went with that guiding principle. Every single customer has an opportunity to give us feedback every year. So question number three. And this is, this is a really important one, I would say, as well. And we're still obviously in the context stage here. Do we need a periodic survey or do we need a customer feedback management system? At SEC, we opted for the latter. This is how I'd summarize the difference. In general, a survey gives you a snapshot in time. So maybe you have a fall tracking survey, something like that. That's typically anonymized as well. So maybe there's 500, 500 people anonymous provide the feedback. Um, customer feedback system is typically much different. So it's more of a continuous stream of data with identified responses, or at least where that's the default. And, and I'll touch on this a little bit more as we go through. But generally, we have to look at, in making this decision, is it enough for us that we get, you know, a survey every two years, or do we need a system that brings on new responses every day. And at FCC, at least, we realized that if customer experience was going to be central to our growth and our self-sufficiency as a crown, it was absolutely essential that we get a continuous stream. So the continuous stream of data means that, yes, I get in my inbox, as well as the inboxes of all of my district leaders around the country, uh, new data every day, different times of day. Every time a new response comes in, a uh, new alert is generated. And I'll show you an example of this in a moment. What we found is that evaluation improves with that continuous stream of feedback. So, for instance, when we had only an occasional survey way back uh, before my arrival at SEC, um, although I was on the vendor side, there was something called the Customer Loyalty Index, and I believe that was done every second year. And what we found is, you know, that was really susceptible to seasonal effects or um, local peculiarities at any given time. So maybe a branch was um, 
had a very high turnover during a certain period. It, it, we just didn't find that we were able to evaluate as accurately with that occasional sort of feedback. And then the other difference is this anonymized versus identifying feedback. So we explicitly, on our scoreboard survey, asked for permission to connect the customer information with the loan information to search so it can be reviewed. And that improves, that improves things for us quite dramatically. Action improves with an identified stream of feedback. So it's not just about being able to report 20% of people are dissatisfied with service in this particular location. It's also about saying, by the way, it's these 20% of people, and they would like to follow up from the office like this. So that is what's absolutely critical for us. Now, one of the things about working in agriculture and primary production that, as well that makes this so important is, as many of you know, there are fewer producers every day. So we have fewer potential clients every single day on the primary production side. That makes customer retention for us an absolutely vital issue. That it's not like, um, say, a typical financial institution who can, in Canada, who can depend on a growing population to provide a new customer stream. For us, it's far, far more. So let me give you an example here of what individualized feedback looks like in this system. And we just created um, a simple example of the post-loan survey. And this is what I'm about to put on the screen here is an example of what will show up in a local leadership box as soon as the client has completed the survey. And in this case, it's a post-loan survey. So hopefully this is coming out reasonably well on your screen. And to give you an example, it's, we've made sure that these sorts of things are BlackBerry friendly because my local teams are typically very mobile and on the move. And so we've got their overall score. We've got the sales area, district, field office, whether or not it's a dealer loan for something that came through a third-party channel to us. The section below you can see that's whether there's required follow-up, um, our open-ended comments, et cetera. It goes on for a little bit longer, but this is the idea of connected, individualized feedback that we get. So it's connected to a very specific customer, in this case, a very specific interaction, and with very specific feedback related to them. So just, just for perspective, for some of you, I look at every single one of these that comes in over the course of the year. So that means any given year is between eleven and 15,000 surveys that I'll look at any given day. This may make you say that I need to get out a little more. I, I probably do. But in any event, it does give me a great picture at that level. And more critically, by going to the district director and the customer service manager at the local level, and they get these, they can make the experience better for that individual client at that time. So this doesn't mean we stop at the individual level. We also aggregate and report on all the trends. So just as a, for instance, you know, we've anonymized which district this is, but we compare um, the national scores to the district scores all the time to look at it over time. For instance, if there are some real service problems in a district, and of course sometimes there are, this is another advantage of the continuous stream of data. If, for instance, um, a district is tracking consistently 10 points below our national number, over time, well, we can actually at that point start writing off the possibility that it's simply a seasonal effect or a one-time effect. These are actually generally pretty serious services. So the idea behind this is to get both aggregation of data and localization. For me, it's the best of both worlds. So we can look at local trends, regional trends, all the way up to national trends that we report to our board and our senior leadership. Although capturing those numbers isn't interesting unless we can turn it into action, very specific action. So we can take local trends, write down individual surveys, and create other individual or local actions. And my team work closely with our operations leadership to craft action plans for all of our local offices based on drivers within their data. Likewise, we see some specific trends regionally at times, and then we can work on specific regional actions there. And national trends, again, national and overall. Action. Sometimes working very closely with our national policy and process team. So that's what's critical. So connecting that data all the way through. So question four. Which events define our customer life cycle? So at this point, we needed at FCC a customer feedback management system 
rather than a periodic survey. We needed a really robust way of answering the question, how are we doing now and why? And we also realized, you know, to meet our guiding principles that every customer had to have the opportunity to give us feedback every year. So given that, we needed to look at what's our true customer life cycle, what's the best way we can live up to that and get the robust feedback we need. So I mentioned before the difference between a survey and a feedback system, and I'll tell you a little bit about more about how our feedback system works. So I talked about that continuous stream of data, new surveys coming in all the time um, for analysis and also real time, as much real time action as we can. For us, the key to that is event generated feedback trace. Um, which is really a complex and researchy way of, of saying that specific things trigger survey. We have three processes in our scoreboard system, the post-loan, the report card, and the customer ad. So the post-loan survey, this is triggered as soon as the money is dispersed to the client, right after a loan. So this is our most recent interaction with us. We wait until that interaction is considered complete within our internal systems, and we speak for that through our internal systems and then the customer gets a survey. The report card survey is a little different than that. So that comes on the anniversary of their most recent loan with us. So it's essentially an annual check-in of sorts. Now that day will move from time to time. If they get a new loan or they've had a new loan recently, we don't send them this right away. So they're obviously so we don't exhaust the audience. The third trigger is customer exit survey. So once all of their, all, all of the customers' accounts with us go completely inactive, that creates a flag for us where we send them a customer exit survey. And what we're most looking for there is, again, reasons for exit, would they return, how this, how their experience was overall. So these are three different surveys, three different kinds of triggers, but it allows us to live up to our guiding principle. And while they're different events, they have common core questions. So there's seven questions on all three of the surveys that are common, that allow us to connect those things. And they form our customer experience index. Now, why do we do that? Why do we look for those event triggers with common questions? It provides a very clear focus to the organization. And what's most important is well beyond the research team. I know from my days on the vendor side and elsewhere that if, if the data you're producing isn't fundamentally usable by the front line, it will tend not to get used. Uh, it'll tend to become what I call boardroom research. So if something that's presented one day, then, wow, that's really interesting. Someone should do something about that someday. Then put on the shelf and, and not use. Whereas the clear focus we provide, or we've tried to provide at least in our scoreboard system, leaves no doubt for front line staff about what's expected. And that, also, that means it also improves our consistency pretty dramatically. So we're not looking necessarily for things to be identical, but there are certain outcomes that we're expecting from all of our offices. And that means the survey and the way we do it is also about expressing a credible commitment to customers. And we get a lot of positive feedback from customers on the survey process, as well as the fact that we ask specific questions. The, the feedback that we get from customers that satisfies me the most is when they comment that uh, I know it, I'm filling this out because I know FCC will take action on it. I've seen it before, which is true. So it's a way of expressing our values, and these are the these are the outcomes we we were expecting you to have. How did we do? So I spent all this time on concepts because I do find, in general, the thing I see most often is. Lots of organizations, private sector, public sector, nonprofits, uh, charities I'll do pro bono work for, go skip, pro- skip concept by and large and typically go straight to design. Whereas from my perspective, if you get the concept right and it's worth spending that time, uh, I won't say design follows, but it certainly becomes much, much easier. You'll have far fewer unproductive committee meetings, for instance, on the structure of the questionnaire. Because you can always refer back to Key, to, key outcomes that you're after and guiding principle behind the process. So get the, get the concept right and design becomes a lot easier. Now, this isn't to say that design is unimportant because it, it's very important. I, as I see it, there's three different sections to customer feedback management questionnaires. The first is the critical outcomes, and this is where you want to have the debate. 
and where you want to spend most of your time. Ideally, in CFM questionnaires, and it's certainly been the case for, for us at FCC, you want to keep those critical outcomes constant, and I'll talk about those in a second. Um, and then there's supporting behaviors, and those can rotate more often, I mean, preferably not all the time, uh, but behaviors that support those critical outcomes. And the last piece, and this is it's more optional, but exploratory or supporting data. This could be a simple open-ended question, for instance. So, that leads me straight to design two, question five. So, what are our critical outcomes? Um, and I don't just mean desired outcomes, because we, the problem with critical versus desired, by the way, is desired outcomes uh, quickly leads you to scope group, in my case. So, the three sections of these questions, let's talk a little bit about what critical outcomes mean. Another way to look at it, especially in a market environment, is why do customers choose us? But it could be why do donors choose us? Fundamentally, how do you know you're living up to your mandate? And how do you express that credibly to customers? So, more than anything else in design, it's those critical outcomes. If you were, if what is it specifically that we want clients or customers to say when they're done dealing with us? What is absolutely essential? If we could guarantee them to say only one sentence about our service or evaluate on one piece, what would it be? And it's really important, in my opinion, to be ruthless at this point. Because if we're not ruthless about those critical outcomes, we can lose focus. And when we lose focus, we end up with 30 minute questionnaires. Things like that. So this is all about foundational principles. Why does my organization exist? And how do I know I'm doing a good job? So in this, any of you who are responsible for this process, it's all about championing clarity. Let me give you an example of a critical outcome in FCC because I've kept that at a fairly high level. So easy is really important to us. That is, in our early discussions with senior leadership, all the way up to the board in a few cases, as well as our operations leadership, one of the things that is critical in our customer experience is being easy to do business with. So the statement is, if easy to do business with, if easy to do business with FCC. And let's break this down a little bit now. What are our supporting behaviors? So I mentioned it's easy to do business at FCC. We want to see top box responses to that as often as we can. And anything below that, we're not happy with. Now, that by itself doesn't give my local leadership a lot to work with to influence any given interaction. So then we've got to look at the behaviors we need. So the outcome, what, pe what we want people to feel about us, what we want people to say about us, so what are the behaviors that lead to that? So here's where they need to be simple, clear, and connected. And as much as possible, I, the thing that we've learned, certainly, is the more obviously connected and resonant these pieces are with your frontline staff, the people who need the action strategy, typically the more effective this will be in improving the client experience. So I'll give you an example. So the outcome we want is easy to do business at FCC. Some of the supporting behaviors I have here on the left, responses to the question, staff are available when I need them. The policies were explained clearly to me. Those two typically combine on a post-loan survey to create a very high easy-to-do business score. So the important piece on the supporting behavior side, it obviously has to be connected to one of these critical outcomes. Beyond that, though, any one of my frontline staff should be able to read that, the, the items on the left, and understand what behaviors are expected by from them. So, for instance, if policies are explained clearly, is a chronic problem in some offices, which, as you can imagine, it will be in offices, say, with especially high turnover or especially inexperienced staff. When we see that happen, we know it'll be less easy to do business, so we engage, uh, for instance, our operations education managers to make sure they're, they are at that specific office working with the staff to get them up to speed on policy as quickly as possible. This is also brings up the value of rotation. So critical outcomes, if they're truly critical and they're truly foundational to what your your agency is about, or your organization is about, those should change quite infrequently, I would think. That's really about core values and core differentiators. 
there is value in rotating behavioral questions. Supporting behaviors, because those will not necessarily remain constant over time. So those are things we have changed from time to time, as, for instance, certain variables in our model cease to be of any predictive value for the outcomes. I don't, by the way, anticipate staff available when I need them. I, I don't anticipate that whenever declining. That seems to be a constant number. But so on the design side, understanding the critical outcomes and then really understanding the supporting behaviors that need to be acting locally is, is significant. And this does not require a lot of questions, by the way. This can be done in, in just a handful of times. So that takes me to question 7 of 10. And this is one that uh, my team can tell you occasionally makes me cranky uh, from time to time. Does every question on our survey pass a so what test? By which I mean, can you look at that question and understand how an outcome will influence action. So let me give you an example. So you're asking the question, and let's say it's 55% yes, 35% no. You should, you should be able to put that test to any question and understand which action you'll take. And if you can't, I'd really say challenge the inclusion on the survey. So it's just a rule of thumb. So if this comes out 65% top box, or this comes out 65% yes, or 35% are unsatisfied, we should know immediately and should be aligned with operations, uh, whatever that looks like in your world, on what that means for action. And if we can't, um, that's a really good sign of something being nice to know rather than need to know. This is the idea here. It's just that every each behavior measured is coachable. And that's one of the principles we look at in our design. Um, could, can we create homework? And I'll talk more about our coaching piece after that. Can we create homework for our senior leadership, regional leadership, local leadership, right down to local staff, with that question? If we can't, why is it that we're asking? So for design, really important to keep it simple and clear, just like Jonathan and Maggie and me. Well, it looks like kind of an improvised sandbox here. So, so finally, execution. And I also find that this is an area that's sometimes neglected by those of us in evaluation and research. So, question eight, ask yourself, and we're in the execution area. So, which collection method best allows customers to provide us with feedback? And this really does require knowing your client base. So, I often uh, spend time talking about what I see as mega trends in research. I'm just going to talk about uh, one piece here, the, a key trend in data collection as I see it. And that's uh, the change away from interruption research to engagement research of different kinds. And I, I find this very exciting. In lots of ways, it's also a real challenge for those of us who are looking to do evaluation. But interruption research is uh, fundamentally research that happens at the originating company's convenience and occurs for the respondent as an un unwelcome intrusion. So the template for this, which is which is rapidly disappearing, thankfully, is the uh, call at dinner time, for usually from an unrecognized number. If you pick up the phone, there's the awkward click of the auto dialer that you can hear, uh, followed by usually someone who's been poorly paid, poorly paid, poorly trained, and poorly treated at a call center who will then lie to you about the length of the survey they want you to take. That form of interruption research is going away, mostly. Uh, I'm pleased to say this largely because there's been consumer revulsion at it. There's much more competition for time now than there used to be. So it's much more now about engaging people as much as possible where they are and how they want to engage. Now, for us, what that means is that we need a multi-mode format for our client base. So our median customer is about 52 years old, rural, and male. So that makes that makes a difference in how we reach them. So what we found is to get the coverage we need in the most efficient way we can, we mail the invite as immediately, essentially, and then our respondents have a choice of how they return it to us. So they can fax back, they can mail back, and increasingly, they simply fill it out online. And we're introducing some mobile options later in the fiscal year as well, should they want to do that. The idea is, as much as possible, rather than them completing it when I say they need to, 
they can complete it at their leisure. Given the seasonality, especially for our primary classroom customers, this is essential. So we've been able to keep our response rate steady um, and certainly higher than, than before when we were more dependent on the phone by taking this approach. We've also had a lot of customers express that they appreciate that as well. So question nine. To reward or not to reward? Um, when I'm saying this as well, I'm referring to staff. So what we produce, uh, I'll show you here in a moment, is a customer experience index. And we spent a lot of time at FCC debating um, not just the why, but in the how, but is it, in essence, a good idea to reward staff based on customer feedback? So yes, should compensation, compensation be impacted by survey results? As somebody who has argued both sides of this quite passionately, this very much is a, uh, uh, to me, a reasonable people can disagree on this one, without a doubt. Ultimately, uh, we've seen more pros than cons from attaching compensation to these results. So our decision has been at FCC to, yes, actually, this is central. And it's central to us because our differentiation, our place in the market, the way we fulfill our mandate is all down to the customer experience. So not making, so not having that as a priority, but tied to remuneration, uh, would, just wouldn't fit for us. And it wouldn't keep it as central in the minds of frontline staff as we'd like. So one of the ways we talk about it on our team is monetary targets, in terms of volume of loans and not having loans going to arrears, things along those lines. That's about the business we do. Our CEI targets, our customer experience index targets, are about how we do that business, which is hugely important. That's about how we represent the shareholder. That's about how the market experiences us and whether people will do business with us again. And fundamentally, there's, that's how we want to be. That's how we want to show up in the market. So, mention again our three processes, the post loan report card and customer exit. They have that common core of seven questions, even though the supporting questions differ because they're different different parts of the customer life cycle. So those seven questions through all of those events and all those surveys produce those critical outcomes we blend into a single CEI score. We find that having a single number for staff to focus on really helps. And those critical outcomes, you got a local office, customer experience index for our 100 offices, region and district, CEI for our five sales areas and uh, 25 districts, and a national CEI, which is the one that's reported to board. And, and of course, I have lots of my variable pay attached to, so it certainly has my, uh, certainly has my attention. The feedback process is totally transparent. And what I mean by that is every local leader who has this as part of their goal knows about every single survey that has gone into their score. They know exactly how the score is calculated. And when my team and I are on our game, they know exactly how to, how to improve things as well. So that means it isn't a number that surprises them. It isn't a number that is a mystery to them. The transparency is absolutely critical. And given that they have a nice chunk of their variable pay attached to this, I, in my opinion, that's essential to have it transparent. This is also why, going back to the continuous stream of feedback being important, I think that piece is essential because, again, if you're going to evaluate somebody, this is a better way to get a picture of their entire year um, than a one-time process. So heading to the last stop here. And the final question. I also think uh, researchers in particular are, are guilty at times of ignoring this question. So what should the sense-making process look like? So in our case, uh, and this is where we had lots of stumbles out of the years, which I'm more than happy to, to talk to anybody about. Um, you know, from our perspective, conceptually, we realized we needed uh, to live up to our guiding principle through a customer feedback management system, we looked at those critical outcomes, we looked at supporting behaviors, we looked at this compensation get attached to this. What should the sense-making process look like? So another trend um, that I like to talk about in dissemination, that's a mega trend in research, actually is, is sense-making versus information overload. So the time we find ourselves in right now 
it's very exciting, and yet it's also very, very different from a lot of what's come from before. So if I go back even 10 years, a lot of times the issues are about finding the information you need, getting access to it, uh, slowly collating, putting it together, things like that. A lot of times it's about information access. I, I would say, in general, the issue today is quite a bit different than that. It's actually about sense-making. We've never had more fingertip access to good data and good analytical tools and fast analysis tools than we, than we have right now. So the real edge comes to those who can make sense of it. Those who can speak with those who need to action it, whether at the most senior levels or at the most local levels, in terms of actionable feedback. Who can make sense of a massive stream of data and turn it into action that improves the experience? So, for us at FCC, uh, yes, research is about data collection, it's about flexible infrastructure, and it's about focused data-driven coaching. So it's not enough to collect the data, it's not enough to report it. It's also about working with the end users to make sense of it. And that also means poking and prodding from time to time. So that means as a research team, we have to see the national picture overall. We have to know what works and what doesn't from the national level all the way down to the local level in a data-driven way. And what we do a lot is we hit the road. So we'll sit down with local leaders and we will evaluate thoroughly, here's what the data are telling me, and it's a dialogue. We go back and forth. Okay. Here's what the data are telling me, we, for instance, we have a real issue with staff availability in this office, and it's been trending down for 12 months now, and we ask police at what they make of it, and usually we leave um, with an action plan of some kind of hand. Okay. That, led, that approach has led to enormous gains in our customer experience in this not, not coincidentally, I would say, that's also helped to lead to significant growth in our portfolio, our reputation scores, et cetera. So when we do office analysis, we look at the CEI trends, but we look at their drivers too. So it's not just about the top line number, it's about those supporting behaviors as well. And turning that into, hey, if I ran this office or if I ran this district, here's the two things I'd work on. So helping them prioritize within that stream of data. Sense-making helps us focus on the right things, and it helps us prioritize. Those of you who worked in evaluation or research in the past have no doubt encountered um, audiences very often who are simply overwhelmed by the data. And when they get overwhelmed by the amount of data, they'll tend to tune out. And they may do a couple things. They may not take any action, or they may simply take whatever comes to mind. Where I think researchers have to play a role is in sense-making so that we have the best odds of taking the best action. And that goes back, though, to design and concept. Because if those things aren't right, the execution on the sense-making won't help. Incentives, my team is not just me. My team has skin in the game as well, so to speak. So all of our variable pay is also attached to the CEI as well. Because, in my opinion, it has to be for us to be credible coaches. It also means that it keeps a front mind for us to prioritize. So it means that when we work with local leadership, we don't arrive as, as somebody who isn't, who's is a completely disinterested party. We arrive with skin in the game. Hey, improve. It also has an interesting way of making us mutually accountable. So I will occasionally joke with trouble districts that uh, I get cranky if I think my variable pays at risk, which I do, by the way. So, uh, so that's a good reminder for them that uh, I'll be keeping an eye on their action plan and working with them. It also, that's on the one side, on the lighter side, it also means that we're cheering along with local staff as they make changes. That bled off the screen a little bit. Ultimately, on execution, what you're looking to do is make the results work. And I do find in research that we, we sometimes skip over that. That the value of a research program to me is in the action ability of it, the action we can take. Does it fundamentally change the customer experience to be better in our case? So just a really quick quick recap before we wrap up here. Um, I took you through 10 questions that we went through at FCC, uh, concept, design, and execution. And I'll just reiterate that I think most researchers and evaluators spend by far the most time on design, and we'd be better proportionately to spend more time on concept and execution, and particularly, I'll say, on that sense-making side. So with that... 
I think I turned control back over to Cody for the question period. Thanks, Greg. That was fantastic. Um, we're going to do a little bit of a question and answer period. So if you mess up the chat box in front of you, feel free to, to send those our way, and we'll go through them one at a time. And, and we've got one question for you right now, Fred. Um, you said you mentioned that the FCC uses core questions. Uh, what are those seven core questions? Good, good question. So I can provide, um, just for anybody on the call to uh, feel free to reach out, and I'm happy to elaborate on any of this in, in future, too. Uh, so examples would be easy to do business in our FCC. FCC cares about my success. We have a problem resolution question. So if they've had an unresolved problem, even if it was 20 years ago, you don't get scored positively on that. Um, and then satisfaction, loyalty, advocacy essentially three levels of that. So are they satisfied with our service? Are they planning to use us again to have new needs? And then are they recommending us to others? So those those cut through our post loan, our report card, and our exit service. Um, I will say on that, it's always nice to get uh, an exit survey, for instance, from someone who simply retired from the business and has uh, very high scores and a really nice story to tell, say, about a staff member that made a difference to you over the course of their career. Those are fun to read. Great. Um, great. Excellent. Uh, another question we have is, uh, could you spend a moment talking about the sense-making and operations that man for managers and local level leadership? Yes, thanks. Um, so it, it looks uh, there's both a virtual and an in-person component to it. So, um, some of it is when we put out our monthly report uh, each month. Now, they get the surveys every every day if something comes in. But we put out a report every month that's, that's simply top line. But we'll also customize things for our districts. So if we know that a district is working in an action plan on a couple of key pieces, uh, we'll also run some custom analysis for them. Or if there's a particular segment type they struggle with, we'll do that. Um, but we also do what we call our roadshow program. So every six months, we have a couple-hour meeting with local district leaders um, where we sit down and we discuss their offices in great detail. And what's really important there is, is getting them we'll, – we'll pop something into our – we'll pop the numbers into our model. We'll look at the supporting variables that are most likely to impact the experience, and we'll talk with them about that. What does this look like in your office? How can we improve it? Um, What's the plan going forward? And what, what we've been told helps a bunch there is it changes it from the cold traditional research delivery, which is more here's some data tables or here's a report with it's descriptive, and it makes it live for their world more so. So it's really just about having a conversation with the numbers. And a lot of times that's me offering uh, or members of our team offering hypotheses. Sometimes I say, hey, look, I know this is dropped a lot. Um, how are your relationship managers and customer service reps working together here? Um, are people getting voicemail more at your office than they would be? And so that's what that's part of what helps take it away from being shelfware when we send out any kinds of reporting and makes it much more likely to, to live in that office. Great. We have uh, two very similar questions here. Um, I guess we'll start generally speaking. How long did the implementation, including both concept and design, take for the CEI? Hmm. Um, let's see. It's, it's going back a little ways now. We've certainly evolved it several times over the years. Um, I'd say we had it in within a year. Um, and knowing what I know now, I could do it in, and with the technology that's available today, which is when we started it several years ago, um, could do it in much, much less time. Um, this is one, though, where I think the institutional experience will vary. So, uh, you know, I'm thinking of a, a small charity I talked to not that long ago. They'll be able to get us, you know, some kind of feedback system in much more quickly. They need to go to their board, obviously, uh, um, but that's really about it. The larger the organization, often the longer it will take. Great. Um, uh, and very similarly, 
What was the time frame from switching from the old feedback system to the new feedback system? Did the answer roughly the same then? Uh, about the same time it took you to implement the whole program? I would say so, yeah. And, you know, one of the things that we learned along the way, and, and it will go beyond a little bit of our scope today, but one of the things that, that we learned along the way is really prioritize what I call flexible infrastructure. So the, uh, the system we use now is, I just I can't say enough about it, and the team I have that put it into place, it allows us to adapt and grow for the future at really reasonable cost as well. So uh, incorporating mobile, for instance, later in the year will be terrific for us. I, I would say um, the advantage we have is we've got a system that we're able to customize to, to, to our needs as much as possible. Um, and I, I can really recommend that as well. So I, it will, I think the answer it depends, but I really do think it depends on what the current state is and, and how long it takes. I, I, again, this is one where I'm happy to chat off one with anybody who'd, uh, who'd like to reach out to Great. Can you uh, provide some examples or suggestions of alternative ways to reward staff in organizations where time survey results for compensation is not necessarily possible? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I think the biggest piece is recognition. So, um, there's, I've got, so positive recognition is huge, and I think it tends to be underrated. So meaningful positive recognition, however you do the feedback system, um, is absolutely critical. So, and that includes even those areas that are struggling. So, if they were struggling but have improved, you really want to encourage that. You want to notice it. You want to talk about it as much as possible. The other thing that is, of course, hugely motivating is uh, just simply creating a location list. Um, I know for our district directors, for instance, it's uh, it's certainly motivating for them if they see themselves number twenty-five out of twenty-five, for instance. Uh, for others, actually, they're equally motivated if they're number three and they want to be number one first. So the publication, the public dissemination of the results, I said, when I say public, I mean within the organization, but within organization publication of results, and then making sure you really recognize those top performers who, if, our me- if your measurement system is good, will be the people you probably know are doing a great job uh, going the extra mile for client groups to make a huge difference. Uh, what mechanisms are used to collect feedback, uh, for example, in mailing, comment cards, online forums, etc.? Uh, so, for just to you take our scoreboard system at first, so that's primarily uh, a mail first touch, and then it can come back to us in a variety of ways. And with our audience, and especially because so many of them are going to sell only these days, and that first touch being a mail is is huge because that gives us the coverage we, we need. So that's the way we get we get that back those pieces. Um, so no, there's no scraping or anything like that at this point. Who develops the action plans? Is it directors, managers, with researchers? Is there a process for this? Great. Uh, the ultimate accountability for the action plan rests with the district director. Um, however, because we have aligned our incentives the way we have, uh, my team works very closely with them and essentially vets their action plans as well. So, and I think that's absolutely vital. We've both got skin in the game. We all want to see uh, the best client experience that anyone can have. But it's also critical to me that the ultimate accountability be with the local decision maker, because then I think it's more likely to be action. It's much more likely, for instance, that um, if Brandon District's district director says, you know, team, this is what we're focusing on over the next couple months from a service perspective versus my coming for a cameo at their meeting. I'm just a guy from Regina, whereas their district director is somebody they hear from all the time and they ultimately report up to. So I think it's most effective when uh, the ultimate authority is as local as possible but developed in that sense-making process with researchers. And ideally, the researchers have uh, an incentive to see the same you know, the most positive outcome. Well, Fred, thank you very much. We're 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 up about five minutes from the top of the hour, and we might we might close off now. If you have any additional questions, definitely send us our way. But there was one last question, Fred, and you mentioned this earlier too. If people want to get a hold of you further, is there any information that they is there contact information you can provide them? 
Yeah, uh, probably the best way to reach out is, uh, I, I know, uh, I think you put my LinkedIn profile in the initial invite, so that's perfectly fine, or fred.wall at fcc-fac.ca. Um, reach out anytime, I'm happy to, uh, I, I'm happy to be a second set of eyes or ears as the case may be. So, um, we've certainly learned a lot on our way. I'm really happy with where we are now. I can say that, uh, our CI process is a goal for our CEO. It's um, it's hard for the CEO, but it's really uh, it's really quite central that how we deliver business for our clients. And outside of my kids, that's the thing I'm probably most passionate about. So uh, that makes a difference. One more question did did did, did drop in. Um, since we do have a little bit of time, do you did you take any cues or model from another approach, or uh, is this type of index really your idea? Uh, we did we did look around, and we also looked at things that FCC had done in the past just to just to take what we could uh, from there. Uh, but I really do think we were at a point of resetting, and that's where we needed to start right back at the start. Concept uh, once we got concept right and design. Yeah, we absolutely did look at other alternatives, kicked it back and forth with with our internal partners. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of benefits sometimes to just starting fresh. Excellent, excellent. Well, thanks again, Fred. This has been really great. And like I said, if anyone has any additional comments or questions, we've got Fred's email there. And let us know if we, uh, if you can send any other contact information to our website.